Amen, amen, amen. You know, it's, it's, it is, it's really a strange thing to, you know, be in here when it's empty, even just the echo, the feedback, the echo, it's, it's, it's really strange to see, you know, these empty seats. And I was just thinking, um, you know, about that song and the, the chorus of that song that the Lord is in this place. And usually, especially with songs like that, we equate it to this idea of us worshiping together here on a Sunday morning. But have you ever taken that song and thought about that context of have you invited the Lord into your home, into your living room? And you think about worship in general that, oh, I, I can only worship as far as, you know, that sense of closing my eyes, raising my hands in a sense of, you know, I'm with a group of people and I can hear everyone singing, but what's so cool, what's so awesome about that song in particular, saying, I'm not enough unless, unless you come, that the, the way that song is written in that first person of saying, I'm singing the song, I'm not enough unless he comes, unless Jesus comes. So the idea of us singing that corporately is actually kind of strange because it's a very personal, intimate song and that's how all worship, musical worship should be. We're not singing for the sake of a group singing. You know, we're not a choir, even though Pastor Jeff, that's something that he's been working on that we hope to uh, utilize for special services in the future. But worship in and of, in and of itself is we're agreeing with the lyrics. We're, uh, we're singing those, those, those words in agreement with them that's just so cool. But guys, let's call a spade a spade. This is odd. It is strange. It's strange for me speaking to an auditorium. It might be weird for you, but let me tell you, you guys, you look pretty. You look real good. Hashtag woke up like this. Hashtag no filter. Um, no, some of you, come on, you're, you're chewing on pancakes. You have your cup of coffee. You're on the couch. You're in bed. I don't know what it is, but on a more serious note, how crazy this all is, how awesome this is, that we have the ability to do this that we have been blessed financially, we've been blessed with tangible things, the ability, the, the camera that I'm speaking to right now to connect with you over the, the video wavelengths here. But it was actually, uh, if you guys remember Lee McDonald, he was one of our worship interns a couple years ago and he's come and led worship with us here and there and he's taken a position in Virginia, but he posted this on his Facebook, I saw it the other day, that the persecuted church in some of these other countries would kill for the access we have to each other like this right now. And we think about the persecuted church and we take that, that, that aspect of meeting together for granted and you think, oh man, this must be what, you know, what it's like as a persecuted church where you can't meet together. No, no, not even close. We're still not even close. So there should be a greater level of appreciate, appreciation even now as we're able to connect with each other. So I really hope that you guys can enjoy this even in the strange, the oddness of the, John, get don't stand on the couch. If there really is a John, a little boy named John out there, that would be hilarious. I'm just trying to connect with you guys a little bit. But I know that it's odd. I know that it's strange. You might be on your phone in your living room in your bed. Like I said, your kids are running over the place. Your brother's, you know, flicking you in the back of the head. I don't know what's going on. But we're so excited that you guys are able to participate with us, to watch with us, and to kind of highlight and to jump in with us this morning. I want to come back to what Pastor Bob was announcing, this idea of a victory week a victory week. And when I was thinking about that idea, I was thinking about this idea of victory week and you know, the media team has been doing an awesome job. They've been kicking butt and taking names. We should change that phrase. Um, they've been kicking butt and bringing the name of Jesus. We're gonna change that phrase. We're gonna coin that, kicking butt and bringing the name of Jesus. But the media team, Mike Bulupo, Kyle Habersham, Andrew Conklin, they've been doing a killer job with all the stuff we've been throwing at them. Um, but this idea of victory week, I looked up the definition of victory. I looked up the definition of victory, and the definition for victory is an act of defeating an enemy or opponent. An act of defeating or an enemy or opponent. And when I was thinking about that definition, thinking about what that looks like, the question that popped into my head is, do we know who our enemy is? Do we know who our opponent is? Basically, the victory that we receive, is it the victory we expect? The victory we receive, is it the victory we expect? Because guys, to set this up, as Pastor Jeff read from Matthew 21 with Palm Sunday and Pastor Joe and Pastor Bob are gonna be highlighting some different elements of that passage. The struggle, difficulty, 
that the Jews and the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes, what they had was the victory they were receiving was not the victory they were expecting because they really truly didn't understand who their opponent was, who their enemy was. And it was kind of a, it, it was a surprise to a lot of people how this was gonna play out. Now, if you're bored at home and you're looking for something to do, you're looking for a project for your kids to do, or maybe you, like me, as a you know, 20-some-year-old guy, you're going a little stir-crazy and you want to have some kind of fun project, but one YouTube channel, one team of guys that do crazy things is named Do Perfect. And they've been around for a while doing all these awesome trick shots, but some of the coolest ones that they do are these elaborate maze-like you know, trick shots that open up their videos. If you guys remember the old board game Mousetrap, the, the, I didn't even play the game. I just wanted to set up all the pieces for the cool little trick shot that happened to catch the mouse in the mousetrap. But if you go on YouTube, you watch some of their videos, they start out their videos with maybe it's as simple as a guy who's putting a golf ball. But when he puts it into the hole, it actually goes into this elaborate track all through the building or all through the house that triggers some type of flag to be raised at the end that says, welcome to do perfect. And it's crazy. But So maybe you're looking for something to do and you can set up this elaborate maze with a golf ball or a ping pong ball to, for this really epic trick shot, you know, whatever it might be, something fun for you to do. But... The sh what happens in that elaborate maze and in that you know, craziness in those videos is you never know what's going to come next. You never know what the next element is. So you start out thinking, okay, I'm just gonna put this, you know, this golf ball here. And as it goes into the cup, you think, oh, okay, he made a putt. Why am I watching a, really? This has 16 million views? That doesn't make any sense. But as soon as it goes into the hole, it gets onto this track and it goes down this track and it, bumps into a bowling ball and the bowling ball falls in it, does something else. And each step you have no clue what's leading to the next thing. And it's a complete and total surprise. You have no idea what's gonna happen. Now, what's funny about this is that when it comes to the life of Jesus and when it comes to especially the last week of Jesus' life, this victory week that we're talking about, Jesus lays it all out. He says, hey, this is the trick. Here's what's gonna happen. Now we know it wasn't a trick. It was his divine nature being able to miraculously come back from the dead. But he lays it all out. He tells people this is how it's going to happen. And they still don't see it coming. They still don't see it coming. They still don't believe it. Check this out. Matthew 16, starting in verse 21. Look at this. It says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. <laughs> Talk about gutsy. He rebukes Jesus, saying, far be it from you, Lord. Far be it from you, Lord. Basically, Peter is grabbing Jesus, saying, uh-uh, <laughs> I don't think so. That's not how it's gonna go down, Jesus. And listen to Jesus' response. This shall never happen to you is what Peter says to him. He says, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. I ain't gonna let it happen. No way. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance or a stumbling block to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. He's basically saying, Peter, your expectation of what I'm supposed to do is not God's plan. That's your own plan. The victory that you want to see happen is not the victory I'm bringing. So check this out. There's another instance of this in Luke 24. In Luke 24, and this one I don't believe will be on the screen for you. I did not give this to Michael. Sorry, Michael. Luke 24, starting in verse 18. I'm going to read this slow so you can follow along since it's not on the screen. Luke 24, 18. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Now, a couple of the disciples, this is a couple of the disciples walking on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus pops up and starts talking with them, but they don't recognize him. This is after he, Jesus has been crucified, before he it ascends into heaven. So after he was crucified, after he was re resurrected, they're strolling down the road there and they don't even recognize him. Two of his disciples do not recognize him. Verse 19, and Jesus said to them, what things? 
And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. Listen to this, verse 21. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all this, it is now the third day since these things had happened. These Cleopas, this, these two disciples, these followers of Jesus, don't even recognize Jesus, basically saying, you know what, we thought the victory he was going to bring about was going to look a lot different than what's happening. So even Jesus' disciples, they're questioning, hey, is this really how this is going to go about? John the Baptist at one point, he kind of takes a step back and he goes, wait, is this the guy? Is this the victory that we are expecting? Because the problem is, like I said, the Jews, the religious leaders, they were expecting a very different type of victory because they didn't truly understand their opponent. See, the religious leaders, the Jews, their opponent in their minds was any nation oppressing them. Now, you got to remember, the nation of Israel had experienced hundreds of years of war and famine and exile and slavery with a bunch of other nations, right? So now they're thinking, okay, Jesus is coming. They didn't know it was Jesus, but the Messiah is coming. <clears throat> the Messiah is coming, and he's going to free us from all of these issues going on. He's going to set up the new Jerusalem. If you go back to the minor prophets, it talks again and again about the day of the Lord. So the Jews are kind of set up to think, okay, when Jesus returns, he's going to bring us to our glory again. The nation of Israel is going to be the top dog. This is the victory that we've been waiting on. This is the victory we're expecting. This is the victory we're expecting. Isaiah 25. This is the passage. These are some of the passages that the religious leaders, that the Jews were reading, thinking, hey, Jesus is going to bring about victory. That's the Messiah we're expecting. Listen to this. Isaiah 25, starting in verse 6. But on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, a successful kingdom, a rich, thriving kingdom of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine, well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. So the Jews, the religious leaders, they were expecting a political savior. The victory they were expecting was not the victory Jesus was bringing. At least not yet. At least not yet. And guys, Jesus picked up on this. He had to deal with this. He had to deal with the fact that people weren't getting it. They weren't making sense of this. In John 6, verse 15, after Jesus had fed the 5,000, listen to what happens here. Perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. They were going to take him by force and make him king. But he picked up on this. Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So Jesus steps back. He looks at the situation and goes, okay, I see what's going on here. Uh-uh, this is not the way this is supposed to go down. Not yet. So he withdraws himself so he can be away from people because they were going to take him and force him to be king. And Jesus is looking at this saying, I'm not a political savior. That's not why I'm here. At least not this time around. I'm not here to establish my new heaven, my new earth, the new Jerusalem. I'm not here to do that yet. But I'm here to redeem all people. The victory he was bringing was not the victory the people were expecting. The victory he was bringing was not the victory people were expecting. 1 Corinthians 15, as I wind, out, wind down here. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15 
verses 51 through 58. I want you to follow this. Some really powerful verses here, some strong stuff. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. And the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For the perishable body must put on the imperishable. And this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written. Paul saying this, it hasn't come to pass yet. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And Paul's encouraging the church in Corinth. Now remember, church in Corinth was this, the Corinth was this major trade city. A lot of different cultures. It was a party town because there was so much influx of money coming in. And Paul's saying, listen, a lot of hardship, a lot of difficulty, a lot of frustration in this town. He says, there's going to be a day when you're going to be changed in a moment, in an instance. There's going to be a day when you're going to experience victory like you've never experienced before. But the victory Jesus brings for you now is over sin, is over temptation. So you might be looking at your current situation saying, man, if I'm in Christ, why can't, I, why can't we as believers have victory over this disease? Why can't we meet in person? Maybe you have been looking at your circumstances thinking the victory I'm expecting is not the victory I'm getting. Well, maybe we need to step back and we need to dig into the word this week, interact with the videos this week, and we have to ask ourselves, we gotta reassess. Am I really looking at, am I really understanding the victory that Jesus is bringing into my life? The victory that he is offering to me through his death and resurrection. So this week, I want you to challenge yourself. Like I said, the media team has been hard at work to put stuff together for you guys. The pastors, we've been having some awesome conversations about where we want to go this week, but also where we want to go as a church in the future. And I want you to interact with the grounded videos, those prayer times that come out each day. I want you to take some time as a family to watch those Victory Week videos that come out each night. And you're going to have a reading plan available to you so that you can spend time in the Word as a family. And then those videos, those Victory Week videos, are going to help supplement the reading that you did that day. So what's awesome is you get up in the morning, you can have your devotions through that reading plan this entire week, this Victory Week, and then you have a video that helps supplement the reading you just did. So you can read, you can study, you can talk about it as a family, you can pray together as the Grounded video comes out, and then when you sit down, you watch that 15-minute video or so, these aren't hour-long videos, 15-minute video or so, it's going to supplement that time you had in the Word. So I want you to dig in. Renew your focus on what that Jesus is bringing into my life. Who is my enemy? Who is my opponent? That enemy, that opponent being sin. The thing that's holding me back, Paul says in Galatians, the flesh, direct opposition to the spirit to keep you from doing the things you know that you should be doing. So I challenge you to reevaluate what is my expectation on victory and the victory that Jesus is bringing into my life. For me to have victory in my job, does that mean I need a promotion? Or does that mean I just need to have a reputation of having solid work ethic and honorable character among my coworkers? Is the victory in my family mean that I have a trophy spouse? That my kids are getting straight A's? That they're making varsity? their first chair, they're getting the solo? Or for me and my house, we will honor the Lord? Is the victory you're expecting lining up with the victory Jesus is bringing? One way that we can experience this victory this week is you have the opportunity 
to do a Victory Week confession. You're gonna see this come out on our social media platforms. It's gonna be sent out to you via email. It's gonna be available on our website. But there's gonna be an online form. It's completely anonymous for you to confess sin and confess your struggles. Now, in the spirit of James, confess your sin one to another that your heart may be healed. I strongly encourage you to sign your name at the bottom of your confession. The pastors, we're not gonna be printing these out. We're not gonna be reading these. We're not gonna be keeping them. But all throughout the week, you're gonna have access to this form to confess your sin, to confess your struggles. It is a completely anonymous form. So there is anonymity there. There is safety there. But we do encourage you to own that sin because the Lord already knows. And what's gonna happen is Good Friday, Good Friday, when we come together, we're gonna raise up the cross on this stage. And then Easter Sunday, you're gonna see those confessed sins nailed to that cross. And during Easter Sunday, we're gonna take those sins down off the cross and they're gonna be done away with forever. Whether we throw them away or shred them or burn them, but we're gonna celebrate victory over our sin, over our struggles, over the things that have been holding us back for so long. So interact with the video content. Dive into that reading plan. Confess those sins through that link that you're gonna see sent out. And we're gonna celebrate victory together as we build up to this incredible week, this incredible moment where Jesus has victory over death and victory over sin. But is it the victory that you're expecting? Is it the victory that you're expecting? With that, I'm gonna invite Pastor Joe up to the platform. Thank you, Pastor Brandon. Setting up Victory Week. Good morning, church. I'm hearing a response down to my left, and that's from Bernie and Karen down here. They're cardboard cutouts. We'll be getting a lot of questions about, what, what are those two silhouettes doing down there? What is that? So thank you, Bernie and Karen, for your amens. This is great. So hey, welcome to, welcome to Palm Sunday. We are walking through this passage that Pastor Jeff opened us up with. Pastor Brandon set the stage for us for the whole week, helping us to take a look at, hey, this victory that Jesus provides for us, is it the victory that you and I expect? And that's, that's really the question that we're looking at here this morning. And as we look at this passage in Matthew 21 with Jesus' triumphal entry, it's what we now refer to as the first Palm Sunday. As we look at this triumphal entry, as Jesus and his disciples are making their way into and then through Jerusalem, what's interesting to note is that the victory that he's about to bring is certainly not the victory that was expected by the people. You see, at this point in Israel's history, there, there had reached a fever pitch for the promised anointed king that God would one day send to Israel. And it had reached a fever pitch for a number of reasons. And one of those reasons is because Israel was under the oppression and the bondage of the Roman Empire, which was the global world empire at that time. And they were ready to experience freedom. They were ready to experience deliverance. But this fever pitch wasn't only because of that, but it was also because heading into this last week, this victory week of Jesus' life, the Jewish people were preparing for one of, if not the most important festival of the entire year for them, and that was the festival of Passover. You see, Passover was a reminder of how God delivered Israel, how he delivered them from the bondage and the oppression of the global empire way before the Romans, and that was the Egyptians. And Passover went all the way back to the story recorded in the book of Exodus in God's word, where God delivered those people, his people, the Hebrews, the Israelites, out of Egypt, who had been enslaved for over 400 years and were crying out to God and God remembered his covenant promise that he had made to Abraham and he delivered them out of Egypt in quite a climactic way. And you can read about that in the book of Exodus. And what's important about Passover was that as God made his way through the 10 plagues, systematically taking down each of the gods that the Egyptians worshiped in each plague, the final plague God said that he was going to bring about was he was going to, to take the life of the firstborn in all of Egypt. And so what he said to his people, he said, Moses, tell my people to sacrifice a lamb 
It's gotta be spotless. It's gotta be without blemish. Sacrifice that lamb. And then what I want the people to do is take the blood of the lamb and I want them to paint it around the doorposts of their dwelling places so that when the angel of death comes over, he passes over those homes. And God showing us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. He's protecting his people with the sacrifice, the substitution of the lamb that took their place and he passed over. And so Passover, the festival that the Jewish people now celebrated annually was a reminder of the most important climactic moment in their entire story, in their entire history. And that was God's deliverance of them out of Egypt, but also his deliverance of them out of death. He passed over because of that substitutionary lamb. So this is where we are at in Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. The Jewish people are gathering together in Israel, and this is one of three feasts that all the people of Israel were required to come to the capital city of Jerusalem. Historians estimate that this would be anywhere between two and three million people gathering together in the city and they would gather together and they would, they would prepare themselves, they would purify themselves and history shows that, and we see this in the Gospel of John, that they would actually arrive early. They would arrive a week, sometimes a few weeks early to the city of Jerusalem to prepare and purify themselves for the Passover. And what's interesting is that part of this Passover celebration, the most important moment, the most climactic moment, was the day of Passover. And on this day, it was required, we read about this in the book of Exodus, specifically chapter 12, it's required that each family offers up a sacrificial lamb. And then not just each family, but the whole nation of Israel, the high priest would choose one lamb who was to represent the entire nation, and that lamb would be the final lamb that was sacrificed on the day of Passover, thus bringing an end to that year's Passover. When we open up to Matthew chapter 21, what we see is historically it was a day known as the the day that the high priest and the people of Israel chose the lambs that they were going to sacrifice at Passover. This happened several days before Passover actually happened. And what's interesting to note about this is if you think two to three million people coming into the city of Jerusalem, historians estimate that that meant that there would have been anywhere between 200 and 300,000 lambs sacrificed on Passover. That's a lot of lambs. Where do we get all those lambs from? Well, there's this, there's this town two miles outside of Jerusalem. It's called Bethlehem. It's where Jesus was born. And Bethlehem was known for its herds of and flocks of lambs, its shepherds. This is where David actually did some of his shepherding in the northern hills of Bethlehem. So what would happen is, Several days before Passover, the shepherds would herd all these thousands of sheep into the city of Jerusalem, just that two-mile journey into Jerusalem. And they would bring them all in. And on this day, this lamb selection day, historians say that this is when all the people of Israel would be gathered and they would be out in the streets and they would be waiting with bated breath, waiting for these lambs to enter the city, waiting for the priests to go out of the city and the high priest to go out to select the Passover lamb to then bring it into the city. And then they would prepare to select their own lambs. And what's so interesting about this, with all these lambs coming into the city, is that the high priest He would go out, he would pick that lamb, and he would bring it in. And part of these Jewish celebrations is that they would sing a particular set of psalms at these celebrations, and those psalms are called the Hallel Psalms. All that means is praise, the praise psalms. You can read these, this is Psalms 113 through 118. And they would sing these songs all throughout the festival, all throughout the weeks of the festival. And what's interesting is this. Some debate that when the high priest would bring that lamb in, before the families would select their lambs, he would pick that spotless lamb without blemish, that he would bring that lamb in, and then the people would start shouting, and they would start praising God, and they would quote one of the Hallel Psalms, the praise Psalms, 118, Psalm 118, verses 25, 26, and 27, and it says, it says this, Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. And then it says this in verse 27. The Lord is God and he has made his light shine upon us. Therefore, bind the festival sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. So it is a fever pitch. The people seeing this lamb brought in, seeing these lambs come in, having to select these lambs, the Passover sacrifice that they were going to then bring to the temple courts on the day of Passover, and these lambs would be slain in their place, symbolically representing their sin, taking it on themselves. So the Passover time was a reminder for the Jewish people, is this the year? Is this the year as we look backwards in our story about how God delivered us? Is this the year that the promised king is going to arrive, that he is going to save us, that as Pastor Brandon shared, he's gonna implement his political kingdom right here and right now and overthrow the bonds of our oppressors and set us free. That's why they carried the palm branches. Palm branches were signs of victory. They were signs of peace. They were signs of eternal life in the ancient Near East. So we have all these things colliding together on this day that Jesus enters into the city. And this is where we pick it up in Matthew chapter 21. It says this, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying, go into the village in front of you. Immediately you'll find a donkey and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything, you shall say, the Lord needs them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, humble, mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches for trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. So as we look at the historical background of this, this is the moment that Jesus enters into Jerusalem. Who's Jesus symbolically claiming to be? That's the question. Who's he symbolically claiming to be? Well, we see three things. First, he is claiming to be the king, capital K. The king, the anointed one, the Messiah. And we see this because Matthew points this out. In verses four and five, as Jesus is riding in on the donkey, Matthew tells us this takes place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. And then what he does is he reminds us of a passage in Isaiah. It's 62 verse 11. And a passage in Zechariah. It's chapter nine, verse nine. And I encourage you in your own time, Take a look at those passages, but in their context. In other words, read Zechariah chapter 9 and read Isaiah chapter 62. They're all about how one day God would come, his anointed king would come, he would set his people free, and he would make a way for salvation, not just for his people, but for all the nations. So Jesus is symbolically claiming to be the king, capital K. What we see here is that Jesus is also symbolically claiming to be the shepherd, capital S, the great shepherd, the good shepherd, the chief shepherd. See, he was from Bethlehem. Bethlehem means house of bread. From the house of bread came the bread of life, Jesus himself, to nourish us, to make a way for us. But Jesus claimed in John chapter 10 that he was the good shepherd. The book of Hebrews in chapter 13, verse 12 says that, or verse 20, Hebrews 13, 20 says that Jesus is the great shepherd. First Peter 5, verse 4 says that Jesus is the chief shepherd. He's symbolically showing that he is the shepherd. He's the shepherd of his flock of Israel. You'll see this if you read that chapter in Zechariah, if you look at verse 16, referring to the coming king, that he's this great shepherd to shepherd his people, to bring them back to himself. He's the king He's the shepherd, but he's also symbolically showing the people that he is the lamb, capital L. How do we know that? Because we just looked at the historical background of this passage with all these lambs coming in, the high priest selecting the lamb that year. Jesus coming in, and he's coming in humble. He's coming in lowly. He's coming in on a donkey. He's not coming in on a war horse. He's not coming in with a sword. No, he's coming in in a way that was unexpected, and yet was expected if we look at these passages back in Isaiah and Zechariah 
The problem was is that the people had created their own expectations for what this promised king would look like and what he would be. He's claiming to be the lamb. If you look at John's gospel, chapter one, verse 29, John the Baptist points at Jesus and he says, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Paul picks up on this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, where he says that Christ is our Passover lamb. So Jesus, in this passage, as he enters into this city, is symbolically showing us that he is the king, that he is the shepherd, and that he is the lamb. The question for us is this, friends. Do we see it? And as we look at this passage, did the crowd see it? Did they actually get it? Pastor Bob. Wow, the crowds were really uh, coming in and filling up Jerusalem. Uh, There was no doubt there was a lot of activity. When we think about a parade, when we think about big crowds, uh, we can go to New Year's Eve in New York City, or we can think of other large gatherings around the globe. Uh, People come from all directions, and that is what was happening here on this Palm Sunday. It is a day of excitement. It's a day of anticipation. It's a day that would bring a lot of activity uh, to Jerusalem. And and, and as I think about the crowd today, I, I think about this crowd that's going to follow Jesus throughout the whole week. As you and I work through the scriptures this week, as we have the opportunity to follow Jesus day by day, Uh, we're going to find that these people, uh, they followed Jesus and they listened to Jesus and and they saw what was happening. And the crowd will change. The crowd will become different. But let's take a look at this crowd for a moment. In chapter 21, there are four things that I would like to leave with you today as we talk about this crowd. First of all, uh, his place was in the middle of the crowd. Uh, As Pastor Joe already alluded, uh, there were a lot of people there, millions of people. This tiny town became overwhelmed by people coming from all over the world. And, And right in the middle is Jesus, and he's riding in on this donkey. In front of him, there are people. Behind him there are people. To the sides there are people. And and, and they're pushing. And and can you imagine a large crowd that that can hardly move? And they're they're shoulder to shoulder. And and they're pushing and they're watching and they're shouting. They're raising their arms. There's gladness everywhere. There's excitement on this Palm Sunday. And Jesus is right in the middle of that. Uh, When we think about people joining this celebration, again, it was already uh, mentioned how millions of people would have come. This was an important time. And so there would be a lot of people there. Families would be there. So you would have mom and dad. You would have little kids. You would have people all around. Just imagine trying to take your kids New Year's Eve to New York City. Imagine three and four-year-olds and 10-year-olds and 15-year-olds and mom and dad and everybody trying to get through the crowd, trying to do what they need to do, trying to prepare for this great week. And so there were so many people in this crowd. When I look at this crowd, I think about the fact that this is an arrival that stirred people. This is an arrival that stirred people. Look at chapter 21 in verse 8. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road. Others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And and so here was a group of people and they were throwing their coats down. They had the palm branches in their hands and, and it was an exciting time because here was coming someone who was stirring the crowd. Here was someone who was moving the crowd. You know, when I look at Jesus' life, I realize that uh, he stirred the crowd often. In Luke chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit in Galilee to a, to, and a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues being glorified by all. Here we see another portion of scripture that reminds us in the life of Jesus, wherever he went, he drew a crowd. And this crowd that came together today was coming for a purpose of Passover, but he was in the midst of the crowd, and now attention was drawing to him. 
When I think about Jesus drawing a crowd, I think about how people would gather around him and listen to his teaching. The Sermon on the Mount recorded in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. We have a vast multitude that would sit and would listen to Jesus. And when Jesus finished, they would say, we are astonished by his teaching. We never heard anyone teach like this before. And so we find that as Jesus moved among people, he stirred crowds. He stirred crowds when he healed people. He stirred crowds when, when he brought them to the place where uh, he would teach them and, and give them instruction and talk to them about eternal life. He would draw crowds. In fact, when they brought that man who was sick and they put him down through the roof, the place was so crowded that they had to go through the roof to get to Jesus because people not only were on the inside of the house, they were on the outside of the house. Wherever Jesus went, he stirred a crowd. Wherever Jesus went, there were people who were watching and listening. There are people who were condemning and critical. Think of the religious leaders, the crowds he drew from the Sanhedrin, the crowds that he drew from the Pharisees, the crowds he drew from the Herodians, religious leaders of all type who at times would gather together in their cluster, in their crowd, and they would come and they would question Jesus and they would seek to trick Jesus and they would seek to find some way that they might bring an accusation against him. There was a crowd that really was not interested in who Jesus was and they were out to get him. So you had people who in a crowd were healed by Jesus. You had people in a crowd who were critical of Jesus. You had people in a crowd who were on the fringes and, and, and they really didn't know who he was. They, they heard about him. Uh, they heard stories about him, but they didn't witness anything. And then you had a smaller crowd called disciples. And the disciples walked with Jesus and they had that intimate time with Jesus and, and he spent time teaching them and helping them to understand the kingdom of God. And so all types of crowds were around the Lord Jesus Christ. When you look at verse 9, it says, the crowds went before him and they followed him and they were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed, Hosanna in the highest. And so on this day, all these people that I just mentioned were in that crowd. I imagine that the person who was let down into the house and who was healed when Jesus said, take up your bed and walk, I bet he was in that crowd. Those religious leaders who were critical and condemning, who were looking for a way to make accusation and then condemn, they were in that crowd. There were people who heard about this Jesus. Jews came from all over the Roman Empire. And as they were coming, they were hearing stories. They were, they, somebody was probably telling them what took place in their life as they interacted with Jesus. So they heard the stories uh, secondhand or, or thirdhand. But they were on the fringes, but they were following there were those people who were very close to him, as I said, the disciples, and they were right there with him. They were right there walking with him. So here is this massive crowd. Here is this group of people that are following the Lord Jesus and his purpose. The purpose would change as the week would go on. The purpose of the crowd would change as the week would go on. Here we find a crowd that's shouting Hosanna. Here we find a crowd that's caught up in the excitement. Here we find a crowd that probably has people in it who don't even really know what's going on in the sense of who Jesus is. We know what that's like even today in the 21st century. If you get a large group of people together, there are sometimes people cheering because everybody else is cheering. They really don't know what they're cheering about. Sometimes when we look at uh, destructive behavior, when, when there's rioting and confusion in cities, sometimes violence, sometimes uh, uh, disregard to property, you know, people start throwing things, people start getting involved in something and they don't even know why they're involved. And so here in this crowd centuries ago, we would see that there would be people who would be part of this crowd and they would just follow as we look at this crowd, their whole attitude will change because they will go from praising to crying out, crucify him. And so as you walk this week, 
through the last week of Jesus with us here at Genesis. I want to encourage you to think about the fact that this crowd that is rejoicing today on Palm Sunday, this crowd that's excited today on Palm Sunday, this crowd that's motivated today on Palm Sunday is going to change as D Jesus teaches Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Thursday comes, and the crowd definitely will change. And over the weekend until next Easter morning, there will be a silence among the crowd. So we're going to see a lot of emotion, a lot of up and down, a lot of opinion change as we walk through this week in Jesus' life. So I encourage you, as you've already heard, I encourage you, follow us, follow along with us as we move through the week in Jesus' life. Move through the week yourself in Jesus' life. Let this be something that becomes a reality to you as you look at Scripture and think about what is taking place here. And when you come down in verse 10, they entered Jerusalem. The whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And so now they make their entrance in. I think about his plan in the midst of the crowd. And that brings us to you and me today as we prepare to uh, close out and have a time of worship with Pastor Jeff. I think about us today because his plan in the crowd was to go to the cross. His plan on Palm Sunday, he knew what was coming over Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, what would happen as he got into Thursday and Friday. He knew what was coming and the crowd around him, he knew, needed something more than just a superficial religious experience. They needed a relationship with Jesus Christ. And here, when I think about this crowd, they may not be thinking about a cross. They may not be thinking about a crucifixion. They may not be thinking in the moment about how Jesus would take their place on the cross. But as he was in the crowd, he had thoughts too. I want to encourage you today as you listen to me. There may be some of you out there who tuned in today and, and maybe this is your first time tuning into a church service uh, live stream. First of all, welcome. But then I also want to let you know that this week is more than just thinking about an Easter holiday. It's more than just thinking about, well, I guess I should do something religious. I want you to put that aside and think about the word relationship. Because as Jesus was in this crowd, that's what he was thinking about. He was thinking about drawing people to the Father. He was thinking about offering a gift of eternal life to the whole world. He was thinking about the myriads of people who would be born who would need a savior. He was thinking about you today. And so I want to encourage you today that you would think about this Easter season as having a relationship with Jesus Christ. You might say, Pastor Bob, how do I do that? You know, you're there, we're out here somewhere. Uh, this epidemic is keeping us separated. Well, we have a number you can call at Genesis and someone will call you back. There may be someone you know who comes to Genesis and they know Jesus. You can talk to them on the phone. You can talk to them through Skype or you can talk to them in, in some fashion. Maybe it's just email. But I would encourage you to talk to someone about this relationship that you can have. You know, God loves you today. And even though the crowd was all crazy that day, even though on their mind was Passover, even though they were thinking about the sacrificial lambs that needed to be slain and, the, and all the fulfillment of the law of the Old Testament, Jesus had you on his mind. And dear believer, partner, attender at Genesis Church, friend who's listening out there, be encouraged today. That even in the midst of an epidemic like we're facing, even in the midst of how crowds are fearful and scared today, we have a Savior, we have a friend 
who sticks closer than a brother. Be encouraged in him today. Be strengthened in him today. And let's begin a journey this week together. We as pastors look forward to coming into your living room. We are excited that we can share this a week with you and walk through this week with you from Passover to Easter. God bless you. Let's pray.